All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Derek Kinder. I'm a hydrologic engineer with the Risk Management Center. So this is going to be a two-part lecture where we're going to discuss some key concepts and talk through stream flow data. Probably one of the most important inputs for all this flood frequency analysis is the data you put in. So the next lecture, we'll continue talking about historical floods, perception thresholds, and their representation for flood frequency. So this is our learning objective slide. We're going to focus on three main objectives, which are key data sources, understanding the data concepts for flood frequency, and interpreting the records to develop a full period of record. We're going to show a lot of uh, web resources with URLs. They'll provide additional information. You can use this as a reference, and we recommend you uh, add those to your favorites folder for when you're working through a flood frequency analysis yourself. So the key reference to read and understand is Bulletin 17C. Um, besides the main text of Bulletin 17C, the appendix have great information, and Appendice number 3 and the glossary are also excellent to look at. Um, we now have the ability to use a lot of diverse extreme flood data for our frequency analysis. We're going to go through this in some detail. And here's a quote out of Bulletin 17C. Um, I'll read part of it. So there, there is flood data that we can't represent as a point. Um, and that's information from like crest stage gauges, historic information, paleo flood and botanical information. And basically this is just saying we now have the ability to input um, uncertainty about floods or flows and we can apply them to many years to extend our historic period of record and represent that data properly in a flood frequency analysis. And that's something new with uh, Bulletin 17C compared to Bulletin 17B before it. All right, so here's two important key concepts up front. Um, the two guidance documents and USGS flood reports are always your starting point when you're looking for data for flood frequency analysis. You should read through these um, at least once and have them readily available when you are working on a flow frequency study. So specifically, we're talking about Bolton 17C and uh, our USACE RMC guidance document. They're available on the website. So then you're going to look for stream flow data at your site and within your region. Um, you're going to use any source of data that you can from USGS or any other agency, um, such as the dam owner if it's not owned by the Corps. And you're looking for gauge data, historical data, stages and discharges, and any field measurements to help you understand the, the systematic data at your site. Um, a fundamental concept is to visit in-person libraries, such as the Denver Public Library Western Reading Room that's shown here, um, historical societies, museums, and you want to obtain as much information on floods outside of the gauge record and observations, um, when the area was settled, just general history of the area, all of that can be beneficial. Um, we have as an example here an 1858 book um, on the history of Waterbury, Connecticut. And it specifically mentioned a great flood in 1691. Um, this data can be used in part to estimate the beginning of the historical period that might even include a large flood that happened prior to a gauge being put in. And so the better you understand flood stages and damages, the more you'll understand why certain events were or weren't recorded. This is a way to uh, provide insight onto perception thresholds and flow intervals that we'll talk more about later. So as we gain more information through sources like this, and we move forward with paleo flood and botanical data, all of that information can be combined and integrated and create as long of a period of record as possible um, to put into our flood frequency analysis. All right, and in addition to getting a lot of data, we need to carefully and methodically scrutinize systematic and historic data. Um, it's especially true when we're receiving data from a person, um, sort of an unofficial source. We should at least double check the top five to 10 inflow events that you have in your record. And we've seen a number of times where data can be bad and lead to artificially high or low inflows. Um, and we also need to check, double check historic floods and make sure that they make sense um, and make sure we understand the best that we can about the peaks or the volumes of those estimates. Perception thresholds describe the knowledge we have about floods when there's missing data. Um, we, there's some knowledge that we have from observed or recorded floods, and we assume that if a flood event happened, it would have been recorded. So those observations and the history prior to gauge are used to estimate perception thresholds and the start of the historical period. An um, inclusion of historical floods can add a lot of value for flood frequency analysis, often lengthening the historical period and providing a large or even maybe the largest flood of record. 
And this requires a lot of due diligence in your research in all areas to find historical information. It's a very important task in flood frequency analysis and cannot be skipped. All right, so here I've talked about it several times. We're going to keep hammering on it. This is a brief overview of Bulletin 17C. Um, if you haven't looked at it or if you're unfamiliar with it, it provides guidelines for flood frequency analysis. They're uniform, consistent um, for the entire nation, for planning activities, for flood risk management, and uh, based on flood data. It includes specific sections on extreme floods and frequency curve extrapolation relevant for dam and levee safety. So we have an example here. This is a peak flow time series with a historical, so historical data here, and paleo flood data here on the American River near Sacramento for Folsom Dam. This is example seven, which discusses paleo flood data in Bulletin 17C Appendix 10. That appendix has a lot of good examples um, to help you get started with flood frequency analysis and understand all the different inputs you can put. Um, these specifically are plotted with the software RMC Best Fit that we're going to be using this week. So again, this is the input data. This is the full frequency result. Yeah, we got a question. Yeah. So in that example, is that the practical going up? Yeah. Is that practice or? So we have a question specifically about where we should put a perception threshold compared to the um, interval data. We'll talk about that at a later slide or a later presentation. Um, so Bulletin 17C has a listing and discussion of data sources in Appendix 3. Here's some of the headings on the slide. We need to be familiar with these. We'll cover systematic in just a minute and historical data and paleo flood data will be in a subsequent presentation. So we're going to start right now with systematic records. So in, who in here has visited a USGS gauging station in person before? Who? Um, on, on this slide, there's some sources to obtain some systematic stream flow um, that are recorded in gauging stations like some of you visited. Um, typically, we're going to start with a USGS website when you're looking for data. Um, the Watuga River has a historic peak in July 1916 before the gauging station started in 1940. For this example here, for flood hazard studies, it is crucial to understand how the largest flood measurements were made. Um, the flood of 1916, it says, reached a stage of 22.1 feet from flood marks on a barn a quarter mile upstream from the station, as witnessed by the local resident. Okay, so that's really important information, right? How much can we trust that? It says a discharge of 28,000 CFS was estimated from a rating curve extended above around 5,000 CFS on a basis of a slope area measurement. Um, where can we find information like that? Usually it's um, under the water year summary section on the USGS water data website. But again, sometimes you have to dig a little bit harder to find this kind of information. And this is really important stuff. It can tell us, first of all, the fact that we had a stage in that year and they even estimated a flow, that's great. But it's also good to understand how much we can trust it we can use that to put some uncertainty on it, help quantify that. So here's a gauging station for the Potomac River at Point of Rocks. Um, notice the height of the concrete shelter here. The peak flow is recorded. The peak flows recorded are shown on the right with the historic flood in 1889. Um, notice under the picture the comment on the 1889 flood. So it says, what does this mean about the discharge? So the USGS notes that this was an extension of a rating curve on the basis of adjustment of the peak flow at the station near Washington. That's 50 miles downstream from this site for inflow and storage and slope area. So this is very much not an exact calculation. Um, what can you say about peak flow magnitudes that were not recorded between 1890 and 1895 here? So what, what I think we would say is nothing in this range between this historic flood and when our systematic data starts would have was as big as this flood, right? Or we would have recorded it. That's the kind of way to think about it. So we can, so we actually, even though there's nothing here, we actually know something about the missing years of data between the historic and the systematic gauging period. Oops. Hmm. There we go. Sorry about that. 
Um, so valuable information is obtained from, vis from visiting engaging stations on USGS NWIS website. Here's an example from the Shenandoah River at Millville, West Virginia. The water summary shown on the left here provides gauge heights and extremes for a historic flood in 1870. The pictures show instrumentation platforms, which is the base gauge height elevation, and the equipment in the gauging station. The three largest flood stages are shown on the right, um, and the lower left photo shows the data collection platform, the manual pump to flush the steeling well, and the steel tape to manually measure the gauge height. So if you're lucky enough to, to get this kind of information or to visit the site, you can really get an understanding for what they're doing to get the final product that we use, which is the estimate of stages and flows at the gauging stations. Here's an older example to obtain flood data from a USGS water supply paper. So this example is on the Shenandoah River in March 1936 for their record flood. Um, it says note the time and type of measurement. Um, it also has 1870 historical information and a bi-hourly hydrograph revision to October 1st, uh, 1896 peak discharge on the left. So the hydrograph, again, is quarter hour and hourly on the right. These extreme flood hydrograph data are not going to be found online in a digital format other than PDFs like you're seeing on the screen right now. Luckily, for, for at gauging stations since about the early 90s, um, the USGS NWIS website usually provides instantaneous data electronically. Not always, but we often have luck with that. This is an example on the Consumus River in California. So the 1997 flood peak is the largest at that gauge, and it was estimated from a slope area indirect measurement. So even though we have a nice sub-daily um, hydrograph, it's still good to understand what they use to estimate the peak for that flow. So unlike a continuous stage recorder, a crest stage gauge shown in the picture here, um, it provides a record of the highest stage and therefore probably the highest discharge since the last time the gauge was read. Um, a wooden rod and a cork is used to record the maximum stage. So the water gets up here, moves the cork in the pipe. So the next time we come and see it, we'll see, we can see what the highest stage was since the last reading. Um, it provides a limited range of stages to estimate a discharge. Um, flow intervals and perception thresholds are used to represent this data for flood frequency. Um, main data sources are listed here. On the, this slide, the basic steps are to search and examine these data sources. Always ask yourself if there's any floods outside the gauging station record. Are they the largest stages, but no discharge was ever estimated? Um, if so, how might you get an estimated discharge if all you have is stage information? How are the largest floods measured? And uh, how are, the, are these the extreme floods in the region? So once you have all that data at the gauging stations, you need to look at historical data, and we're going to talk about that more in the next lecture. So in summary, you should now have an understanding of some of the key hydrologic data concepts for flood frequency. There's a lot of really easy to get sources, and there's times where you're going to have to take a little more effort in digging to find all the pertinent data for your analysis. You should remember that not all systematic data is created equally, and you should definitely examine it and ensure that your top five to 10 flows or stages events are real and not due to data errors. And this is definitely a lesson learned from previous projects for us. Um, hopefully with the help of the links and the sources, you can successfully collect the data required for a flood frequency analysis. And just to recap on learning objectives here, we focused on three key objectives. That's key data sources, understanding the data concepts for flood frequency, and interpreting uh, the records to develop a full period of record. We provided multiple web resources shown as URLs, which provide additional information and are an excellent resource for when you're doing your analysis. All right, do we have any more questions, please? Sure. Chris McGinn touched on the record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, we talked about going to like libraries. It's like, when practically would we want to do that? Um, I think there's probably project by project, but on average, if you're doing a base or lower level risk assessment, usually you're right. We're not going to libraries, right? But I'd say even at a lower level project, if you had good confidence that there was something there and easy to get, and 
you know, if it's a local library and somebody at the district can do it, I say go for it. But typically, we're not digging that deep until it's a higher level study. Yeah, I know the paleo flood teams likes to find the museums and the local knowledge. They're already going to the area to go out and do the field work, right? So if they can, they're going to the train museums and the local city museums to find as much information as they can. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so paleo flood data can be geologic evidence, but could also be botanical evidence, tree scars, knocking a tree over a new tree growing on top. So just, yeah, just evidence that plants can leave behind about past floods or lack of floods, yeah. Mm hmm Any other questions? All right. Good questions, folks. Thank you. All right, so this is the second part of the key data resources, but this is gonna focus on historical floods and perception thresholds and their representation in our flood frequency analysis. So this time, like I said, we'll focus on the historical floods, which will be represented by flow intervals and perception thresholds that are represented in, by intervals as well. And we ought to make sure that we understand the importance of examining historical records so that information can be used to extend our period of record with flow intervals and perception thresholds. Again, this presentation has a lot of web resources shown as URLs that provide additional information and you can use and reference in your flow frequency analysis. So to do this kind of work, we need to put our detective hats on. Um, and if, if we can, get your boots on and go into the field or go into libraries, et cetera. So the example we're showing here is uh, from a TVA and it highlights the importance of personal interviews, use of diaries and multiple sources of information to develop a reliable data on extreme floods outside of our gauging period. Um, the photo on the right is from the record stage and the flood on the Shenandoah River in Harper's Ferry prior to the 1936 flood. And you can read this one on your own, but it's just, explain the importance of all the different ways you need to investigate to get the best information you can about these historic floods. So here's a key definition of a historical flood. Um, it is the largest flood that was estimated to have occurred over an extended period of time. Besides the maximum stage, these data can also include discharge estimates and other sources. Key information includes one or more extreme floods, a reference stage for perception threshold, and information to estimate the beginning of the historical period. So some key information, like I said, would be large floods prior to a gauge. A reference stage might be a railroad bridge or a building in a town center. Um, finding knowledge that the largest flood in the gauge has not been exceeded in a longer time frame, so older than the date that we found that historic flood on and just knowing when the town settled, that can, be, that can help us establish the beginning of our historical period. Flood high water marks on buildings are common in Europe and can be found in the United States as well for very large floods. Um, this is an ancient building in Koblenz on the Rhine. It shows, it shows a high water mark of a flood in 651, uh, which is the highest known stage. And it's also compared to more recent floods in the picture on the right. So I know these are more common in Europe, but we've seen them in America too, and they can be really valuable. So here's an example of the June 1921 flood that devastated the city of Pueblo, Colorado on the Arkansas River. Um, there were many lives lost, and this illustrates the high water mark on the railroad depot as shown on the lower photos here. So we have a photograph and also a historical high water mark. Yeah. It's a sad part about our jobs and reading things like 1500 life loss, but now they have a dam to protect that city. So. so here's an example of the data that you can find on extreme floods. Um, information on the June 1921 extreme flood was extensive. They even issued a special issue of ASCE transactions that was published in the USGS reports. 
Um, Alan Hazen, in his 1931 book, examined the effects of this flood and used it to develop a precursor to the regional index flood method um, for regional coefficients of variation in skew estimates and flood frequency. So taking the data that we learned from the 1921 flood plus some additional paleo flood data, example four in Bulletin 17C Appendix 10 um, was input into RMC Best Fit to show the period of record here. So we have flow intervals that are shown with air bars. So that's the historical 1921 flood here and uh, additional historic flood information in 1864 and also in 1893 and 1894. Okay, so historical floods are shown um, with our best estimate, but also an a flow interval as well. Perception thresholds are shown as the solid red areas. And we'll talk more specifically about those later. Yes, another question. Yeah, so the question was, we have systematic data prior to 1921 and after 1921. So 1921 happened in our systematic period of record. Um, most likely it's because the gauge got washed out and there's probably some uncertainty about how big that flood really was. They're probably looking at high water marks and going back and using cross sections to calculate it indirectly. So here's a listing of key sources to search for historical flood data. Um, digital libraries are your gateway to newspapers, photos, diaries, and a ton of other information. The Internet Archive is a good place to obtain history books from cities and towns, such as the 1958 Waterbury, Connecticut history book that was mentioned in our previous presentation. So after you've gathered all of your data, now is the time to accurately describe and represent all flood data appropriately with flow intervals and perception thresholds for our flood frequency analysis. But first, let's start with Bulletin 17C de definitions for flow intervals and perception thresholds so you have that background. And then we'll translate that into best fit. So this is a perception threshold. The perception thresholds are shown here with the gray area here. And then again, the interval data shown with that flow range. All right. And you see we have three different perception thresholds for this analysis. One for the modern time period, historical and paleo flood. And there's also the flow, the four flow intervals that we showed as well. Sorry. Are they using like so the question is, what did they use to define the flow range for these flow intervals? I'm not sure what they used for this example here. It's in the appendix of Bulletin 17C if you want to look more. But yeah, we'll talk about some um, rules of thumb that we use for our modern analysis. So in Bulletin 17C, though, the intervals are designated by a QI lower and a QI upper. And those are based, those are based on observations, written records, or physical evidence. And again, we also have rules of thumbs if we, if we don't have uh, enough in information to quantify what that uncertainty is. Perception thresholds are designated as TY lower and TY upper. And technically, systematic data are interval data as well. Just the QY lower is equal to the QY upper. So it ends up just being a single data point. So systematic and interval designations, I think, are fairly clear here. Either we're, we're sure enough that we just represent it as a single value or we have uncertainty about it, so we represent it as a range. <clears throat> um, perception thresholds are a little bit trickier to understand. Um, Bulletin 17C defines the lower bound as the smallest peak flow that would result in a recorded flow, and the upper bound as the largest peak flow that could be observed or recorded. So when Bulletin 17C describes the lower bound, it's the top of the gray area, okay? It's this top line, that's the lower bound meaning it's the lowest that we would want to designate from a period of record that we know where they were recording data. And the upper bound isn't known, so it's designated as infinity. That's how Bolton 17C describes it. So it's actually the area above the gray curve. That's how you define it, from some flow to infinity. All right, so from Bolton 17C, there's a good list of typical values listed for gauging stations, crest stage gauges, historical floods,
and potentially influential low floods. This is just a reference from both from Appendix C or Appendix Three. I'm sorry. So now this is the same data set we were just looking at for Puebla, but we're looking at it in RMC Best Fit. So just like in Bulletin 17C, systematic data is exact data, meaning the upper and lower bounds for the flow are equal. So it's simply the exact flow measurement. Oops, sorry. So the interval data, sorry, the animations are giving me a little trouble here. So interval data, is defined as an upper and lower bound. Um, in best fit, you can see that we also enter a most likely flow, and that's what informs the, the blue or green dot there in the center. So this is the likelihood, sorry. And remember that the likelihood, so, okay, I'm gonna skip that because we move things around a little bit. We're referencing that back to the likelihood, and we're gonna talk about that in a later slide. All right, so now on to perception thresholds. They have the same concept as we talked about in Bulletin 17C. However, you need to think about them a little bit differently in best fit. So in best fit, you're just entering a single value to represent that perception threshold. It's just the flow value that defines the top of the red area, okay? That flow value represents the flow at which if a flood had occurred, it would have exceeded that threshold flow and been recorded. So therefore, the perception threshold is an upper bound with the lower bound equal to zero but it's automatically equal to zero. You don't have to input that into the software. So the shaded red, reddish area reflects that any flood event in that period would range from zero up to that perception threshold value. Um, in many cases, you will find historical flood data with a stage or a stage and a peak flow, but it isn't too often that historical floods will have enough certainty that is considered as exact data. Therefore, we often need to calculate an upper and lower bound. At the level of study, may determine the techniques used to find those bounds. So for periodic assessment, you may only really have time to use a simplified approach by applying something like plus or minus 20%. That's the rule of thumb uh, that Devin mentioned earlier. So this is loosely based on USGS standards for discharge measurement errors for an estimate that would be expected to have relatively high uncertainty. And depending on the data available, um, you still may not have anything more than using a rule of thumb like plus or minus 20%, even for like an IES study. As the study level advances, you really want to start to use a modeling approach to help define that uncertainty. Um, in most cases, this means using something like a hydraulic RAS model to estimate the upper and lower bound. All right, so in summary, listed here are the key things to estimate. How many extreme floods were, occurred at this site? We're looking for large floods, not something that's similar to like the average or low flow range in our systematic data. We don't care as much about that because it's not impactful to our study. We want the big floods. And what are their approximate magnitudes? Describe each with an interval, which is, includes an upper and lower bound. We're gonna estimate perception thresholds from what you've learned from the historical events or other historical evidence. All right, so when we're looking into our systematic or historical data, it's good to know what type of gauge the data was recorded from and know how any historical floods at that gauge were estimated. A gauging station has almost all or all data as exact measurements where the flow is measured directly, but we can have indirect measurements or estimates based on rating curve extensions or slope area calculations. Knowing that will help put context to the quality or the uncertainty around the flow that we've been talking about. All right, so in conclusion, it is critically important to perform field reconnaissance and investigation on the largest flood stages and flows, understand the hydrologic setting and the discharge estimates, and integrate the historical flood data into the gauging station records. So here are some photos of the largest floods in Wyoming. Um, the left is from the USGS files obtained from an office visit to Cheyenne. The right photos are of the river as seen about 75 years later. So a next step is to examine and include paleo flood data and botanical information. We'll talk about that in some later presentations. So in summary, we learned some more on collecting and examining data from various sources to find historical records of observed events. This process can take some time and digging deep to find a usable information that can lengthen our period of record. 
You should now be able to clearly, clearly define what a flow interval is and know how to add it into your flow frequency analysis. You should also be able to define what a perception threshold is and know enough to interpret historical records to be able to define perception thresholds for periods of record that have missing data. Um, remember that there are different levels of study, so based on study level, you should put in the appropriate amount of effort to do research as well as effort to estimate historical flow values with uncertainty. And just our learning recap, we described historical flow intervals and perception thresholds, and we examined historical records to understand perception thresholds to combine into a full period of record.